introduce themselves. Um, where should we start? So Marquez, would you like to start? Sure, my name is Marcus Bradshaw. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and went to Duke for med school, and then Vanderbilt for nuclear medicine, and then I did radiology in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'm currently at the National VA and Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where I'm the vice chair of diversity affairs. Um, big into mentorship, so always happy to uh, answer any questions that anyone has, not just now, but um, uh, offline in the future as well. Awesome. Laura? Hello, everybody. I am Laura Heineman. I am a cardiothoracic imager at uh, Duke University. Um, I went to UNC Chapel Hill for medical school. I uh, went to Duke for my residency. Did one fellowship at Duke um, in abdominal imaging and a second fellowship in thoracic imaging in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and have been on staff um, at both UNC and Duke ever since. And your APD. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am assistant program director for the diagnostic radiology um, program. And um, I'm also on the leadership council um, with somebody I see in the audience, um, Maria Nujeru, who um, for the our departmental diversity and inclusion committee. Awesome. Uh, Pine, would you like to go? Sure, um, I am Massaban. I, um, I, so I went to med school at USC uh, and I started surgery residency at Stanford. Um, by USC in this audience, I should say University of Southern California, uh, so, uh, so that we're clear. Um, and then I uh, came uh, to Stanford for surgery residency uh, and did uh, three years of surgery residency uh, and um, transitioned to radiology residency. So for those of you who uh, aren't sure or feel confused or uh, feel jealous of the people who are so sure about what they're gonna do, uh, uh, I was very sure that I was gonna be a surgeon uh, and things didn't turn out that way and things turned out wonderfully. So just a, just a note to, to stay open-minded, but uh, switched to radiology. Um, <laughs> and have the, the privilege of being the program director here at Stanford uh, and uh, I, I agree with Marcus. I, I think mentorship is so important uh, and uh, has all different kinds of flavors. Uh, and so you're not gonna just have one mentor. I think uh, we're all here uh, and happy to be supportive, uh, but find several people who you can reach out to over the course of your careers. Uh, who will continue to uh, support and help uh, throughout the time. So uh, probably went a little bit over for intro, but that's that's me. No, I love it. That's perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tomal Mofwe. Uh, you may have guessed from my name, I'm Nigerian by birth. Um, I went to medical school at Duke right after Marquez, so we didn't overlap there. Stayed on for residency in radiology at Duke um, and then moved over to MD Anderson for my fellowship in breast imaging. And now I practice as a breast imager um, at MD Anderson, which is a UT affiliated hospital. And I also work as co-director for education. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cheat a little bit like Pyam did and share a bit more of my backstory. So I did not know that radiology existed as a subspecialty. I sort of knew it, but I didn't know it. And it was at the very last minute I even discovered it. We're talking um, September of fourth year. I started doing an elective in radiology with my best friend while I'd already applied in internal medicine to become an oncologist. Um, and I had just picked oncology because I liked doing a lot of different things. And I thought oncology allowed me to do a lot of different things for my patients because you tend to own the patient. And then I did this radiology elective and it just sort of rang all the bells for me. And it felt really last minute and super rushed 
to flip my entire application at the last minute to radiology. Um, but I had an incredible crew. I wouldn't even just say of mentors. I would say like a board of directors. There was a whole board of directors that I was calling at night. Like, should I do this? Can you change the letter recommendation you wrote for me? Um, and the night before ERAS closed in October is when I submitted the new application. So I think that all of you are already ahead of the game, but I think that you can also see why I'm so passionate about, you know, letting people know about how wonderful radiology is um, and why it can be a great fit, even if it's unexpected. Okay, so can I just get a bit of housekeeping here? Um, is everyone in here fourth years or are there any students in here that are not fourth years? If you're not fourth years, you can indicate in the chat or wave. Oh, we have a first the year. first year. A second yes. year. That's Whoa. awesome. <laughs> we have an IMG. We have a third year. OK, but it's, it looks like the, the vast majority are fourth years. Perfect. Now, we will mostly gear the conversation towards fourth years, but um, you all are also, as more, um, as newer medical students, also welcome to ask your questions. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, dear panelists, what should we look for in a radiology residency program? So I guess I'll start. Um, so I think it's different for everybody. Um, I, I remember when I was a medical student, everyone said, you know, find a program that's you know, you read X number of studies and they have, you know, a trauma center and blah, 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 blah. And then you start going on the interviews and you're like, well, every place I interviewed at, you know, check those boxes that people told me were important. And so what I think is really important is that as a student, you think about what it is that I really want out of my program. And so what I like to ask people is if your program doesn't have X, you won't be happy and like really what is X? And so really I, taking the time to define what's important to you and then evaluate programs to see if they have that. Now, I do think as um, minority applicants, you have another layer and that additional layer is making sure that you feel supported. So if I go to this program, will there be somebody there that will support me? Now, when things are going great, it doesn't matter what program you go to, but heaven forbid, you know, there's a struggle or there's a perceived, you know, problem, then that's where it's important to have somebody that you feel like you could go to that could really coach you through the process of being a good resident and making it through on the other end. I'll, I'll chime in um, to just add a little bit to that. I totally agree with all of that. Um, I sort of, I, I think that you should look for a place where you feel like you could be most yourself. Um, and that I think a lot has to do with sort of, there are two big factors. Um, one is, um, are, are the other residents or the, are who, who are going to be essentially your family for four years. Um, I think it's really important to try to talk to the residents who are there as much as possible. Um, you know, go to, unfortunately, th these days it's all virtual, but um, go to virtual meet out meetings, hangouts, talk to people afterwards, talk to people before, email people, you know, whatever you can do um, to connect, to see if these are people who you feel like you could be yourself with, um, who you feel would be, um, you'd be supported by. Um, so that's thing number one. And thing number two is the program director. Um, is that somebody who you feel um, advocates for residents, um, would advocate for you? Um, I'd, I'd encourage you to ask the residents who are there for some specific examples where the program director has advocated for them. Um, and I mean, it's, it's all a little bit of a sort of 
a gestalt feeling. Um, but I, I, people do have a sense of where you could um, rely on people because residency is a, is a period of life. I mean, it's hard period. Like, you know, it's a, it's a hard four years and it's a period of your life where a lot of things happen um, in, in your life. Good things, you know, people get married, people have kids, uh, but also, you know, hard things. Parents can get older and sick and, you know, emergencies come up and, and your co-residents and your program director are going to be people, people you really rely on. Um, and so I would encourage you to trust your instincts in that regard. Well, one thing I would add is that um, most programs are going to prepare you to be an excellent radiologist. And I think that, uh, you know, you'll get in your mind that, you know, if I, if it's, it's this program or bust is not true. And I think that most programs are going to deliver uh, a great uh, education and frequently um, you'll be your your best advocate and and you'll sort of be uh, learning um, doing a lot of the learning rather than being taught so I feel like you're going to be successful almost no matter what and so I think that that's important to remember especially as you start to pour over your rank list uh, just 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 remember that and I would second the thing about life happening during residency and being in a place where you you uh, will have a sense of community and have a sense of being supported is very important because life happens where you sort of, you reach that age where life starts to happen. I love all those points and I'll add a couple things. Um, I think when you're looking at programs, try to look at a program that's well-rounded. A lot of times, especially in the social media age, there's a star. Like I love Dr. Bradshaw. I want to go to, you know, Vanderbilt for Dr. Bradshaw. I, you know, everybody can sort so of- So do I. <laughs> exactly. Everybody can sort of rally around a star. Um, but you have to be careful because if a program is just built around one person or even one theme, it can get a little competitive because everybody wants to do research with that one person all the time. So really think about how well-rounded it is. And that was a big thing for me in choosing my program um, was that we had- the ability to do research with all these different researchers. There was global health, which I still incorporate into my practice till today. Um, there was the opportunity to have a flex year to do an MBA program or MPH. People had done that while they were in residency. You know, you have the ability to really create different identities. And so it makes for a very collaborative group of residents because you're not stepping on each other's toes. Um, the other thing I also want to touch on too is that as minorities, excuse me, sorry, um, as minorities, sometimes you can um, be looking so much for comfort and looking for a sense of home that you're getting a little bit um, distracted. Don't be superficial in your identification of what constitutes allies and allyship. You'll be surprised um, at how many people will really are really passionate about mentoring you, growing you, challenging you that you have no idea about. I mean, I'll give you um, a little backstory. At the time when I was in residency, um, I was one of very few minority anything and one of very few women. We didn't even used to have a lot of female residents back in the day. Um, very few women, very few minorities. But I mean, that, that was my family. They came to my wedding. My, Program director, his wife, his kids, they came to my wedding. They wore our wedding colors. The Nigerians know what I'm talking about. Um, so you can, you can really create a really beautiful place. So, you know, try to listen for the depth of what people are saying, um, because there actually is a lot of richness that you can get out of people, even if they don't necessarily look like you, because radiology is one of those fields that is, has been slow to diversify. So a lot of the people who are going to pull you up and mentor you will not look like you. Most 90% of my mentors are white men and they're wonderful, um, but it's okay to, to really um, feel supported in an environment where you may look different. Can I ask my resident to chime in to see if she has anything else to add? 
in Imaria. Yeah, sure. She's a third Hi, year <laughs> extraordinaire. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry, really quickly. My name is Amari Nagara. I'm one of uh, the third year radiology residents at Duke. Um, and, you know, grew up in South Florida, went to medical school at Harvard, and came to Duke for residency. And I think I echo a lot of um, kind of the sentiments here, just getting a sense or gestalt for, you know, the best community that you'll feel and kind of prioritizing what's important to you within the next, you know, four to five years, because radiology residency can be four to five years um, and trying to pick a place that um, meets those needs. Thank you for that. Um, no, so now I'll ask, oh, sorry, go ahead. One thing? Please, um, please. Just to piggyback off of what you said about going to a program for one person, I remember I, I was given that advice when I was a, a medical student and thank God I, I was given it because the program I was highly considering, I really liked one person. And by the time I would have been there as a resident, that person was gone. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, it, it, academic radiology these days, there are a lot of job openings and people moving yeah. from place to place. Academics in general, right? I mean, I think that's yep. how academics works for a lot of folks. You know, they they do those those moves. I think that's good advice. Yeah. So let's ask this question. What makes an applicant's application stand out when you're going through it as a, I mean, we have all selection committee individuals here. Let me go. So well, go ahead, go ahead. Laura. No, please. I went first last time. Go ahead. No. Um, well, okay. I will say um, letters of recommendation, I think, um, have a big impact. Um, and have a big impact if it seems like the person really knows you. Um, I, I think that um, a, le a strong letter of recommendation um, from my perspective is one in which it seems like the, the faculty member, and it doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter how senior or junior, or, you know, it doesn't have to be the star, certainly doesn't have to be, you know, the chair or somebody like that. Um, it's much more valuable to me when reading an application when the faculty member who could have just been a fellow like two years ago, clearly has worked with you, knows you and can speak to um, your strengths and what you will bring to the program. Um, I think it's more valuable than having some superstar in the department who really doesn't know you. Um, that will come across and doesn't add a whole lot to your um, application. Yeah, so, so to, piggy, to piggyback off of that, um, I think it is vital that you really think about who's writing your letters of recommendation. Um, I have seen LORs that were like this big, right? There's like a paragraph and it's clear that that person didn't know you. And so sometimes it can be looked upon as like, that must have been really bad judgment when you know that person writes in their LOR, they work with me for three days and they repeat stuff just given off your CV. And it's like, okay, well, like Laura was saying, I learned nothing about that by reading that LOR. And so this dovetails with one of the questions that um, we sent out earlier is that, you know, how do you get a good LOR? And I think you get a good LOR by long-term uh, relationships, right? And so for those of you that are on this Zoom that are, you know, first and second years, I think it's vital. And so I encourage my mentees that when, you, when you're early on, start investigating the different specialties that you have interest in and you start to build those relationships, right? And then you can ask to join projects and then you'll be amazed at how glowing an LOR can be when someone says, I've known them for two or three years and I've seen their growth and I see everything that they can potentially become versus someone that says, well, they showed up you know, at the beginning of their fourth year and I know this much about them. And so I think part of it, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I was gonna ask a follow-up question. So if it's a really good letter recommendation but it's not from somebody in radiology, does that still carry weight for you? Like, is it important it, to prioritize the radiology or totally. prioritize the good letter? So I think you do need to have one letter from somebody in radiology, right? Because you're going into it and that there's some people who would say, 
you don't have a, a, a radiology LOR, that might be a red flag. So you need mm -hmm. one person in radiology. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I think it's really much more important that you get people that know you and can speak to who your character is, because that's really what we're trying to figure out. If I accept you into my program, what type of person am I getting? Can I project it forward to see what type of resident I'm going to have? And will you be somebody that will, maybe you're going to show up and read scans or you'll be an excellent radiologist and that's great. But there are other things when you start reading through applications or you see LORs where it's like they start speaking about, you know, your leadership skill or they're great in doing research or they did so much in community service. And so you can start to project that if that person's in my program, then potentially they could fill different roles even as a resident. So then it becomes a win-win. They come, they get the education, but they're also doing stuff that gives back to the university or to the surrounding community. And I realize I probably um, answered the question. I would probably should have been focused more on what are we looking for in terms of the individual than I am, like, what am I looking for in the application? So I might, you know, those are two different questions. Um, and and I realize I may not have answered the right question. Um, so um, well, please, I was please keep going. What were you what would you say you were looking for in, in a good applicant then? Um, I would say I want somebody who um, is patient centered. Um, I want somebody who is gonna be a hard worker. I want somebody who um, is a team player. Like we said, you know, things happen at, during life, you know, during the four years. And um, we want people who are gonna be supportive of their um, fellow residents. Um, it, you know, it's great to have somebody who is, you know, clearly a leader and has a, an idea of, of where they want to head and things that are important to them. That's great. Um, I don't think that's required. Um, and uh, I think um, the most, the, the highest priority is, is, at least for us, for me, when I go through applications is, is this somebody who is um, engaged in learning, interested in learning, willing to work hard, and is going to be somebody who supports their, their fellow residents. Those are kind of the top things and everything else is it's kind of icing on the cake. Um, I look for a good story. I love a good story. And it, and if it's a coherent story, all the better. And what do I mean by that? You know, a good story, I'm in the VA, I'm in a government building. So every, you know, if I don't move for a minute, the lights turn off here, it's to save your tax dollars. So uh, sorry if it distracts you or it tends to distract me a little bit. So what I mean by that, you know, a good story, you know, is, is, uh, you know, uh, I think when somebody uh, communicates their distance traveled in a way that that you uh, can empathize with and can understand and reflects some of those um, characteristics that we've discussed that are important, uh, you know, people working hard, people persevering. Uh, so, so I think that that's great. And what I mean by coherent is that it's not just in your personal statement but you see it in every part. Like, you know, I care about patients. It's not just because, you know, you see that that person volunteered, uh, uh, you know, it's that, that you know, uh, you know, there we all, you know, if, if it was particularly homelessness or, some, you know, it's, you know, something that you experienced, you, it moved you to action and you demonstrated it through your volunteer efforts through your work. Uh, and and I, I find those things to be moving and those things to be very much worthy of our support because it's not something that's been put together for the application purpose. It's a life lived. And some that's a person that you want on your team. And I think that that, that, that sincerity comes across. And I think that that's very important. Um, 
that that's what I would say is is the primary thing. I also look at things that I think most people don't, and I'll just share a few just to give you a sense of how random this process is and whose pile your application lands on can make a big difference. So I find that if, if anyone was a waiter or a waitress for more than just a summer, uh, that person needs to be interviewed because that person understands hard work, understands uh, you know, customer service and understands that you know, despite that you're not always treated well by people, you're still gonna do a good job and you're still, you know, so, so to me, that's something that I feel like is very valuable, you know, but that's so random, right? And it's not like you can go and get that experience now or people who did crew for the life of me, I'll never understand that, right? You get up at five, four, 5 a.m. You're rowing in a, in a boat with like six, five other people. I don't know how many other people. There's like no glory in it. It's just hard work and teamwork, right? So like those are things that I might look at, but it's so random, you know? And so just remember that this process is also kind of random as well. Uh, and you put your best foot forward and hope that people see uh, uh, how special you are. Awesome answers. Um, Manasi, would you like to ask your question? I, you know, I saw the question. Oh, Manasi, you want to ask? I Go ahead. Sorry, I got triggered because I saw the question and I thought I need to comment on that. So, you know, I don't think that it's uh, mutually exclusive. She to... says, just one second, I'm going to read the questions just so in case people are on their phones. No worries, Manasi, I'll read the question. She said, um, would you recommend using an, a letter of recommendation from an away rotation as that would be a short term association with a mentor? Yeah, oh, thank you for, for me. I'm sort of uh, getting ahead of myself. Uh, you know, I don't think it's mutually exclusive uh, from what we said earlier. You know, we've had folks who come and do a short away rotation and write three, uh, three articles as a result of that, you know, and you get to know that person and you get the letter that says, we've never had someone this productive join us. Uh, so, so I don't think that uh, I would say that you, you shouldn't get uh, a letter but I wouldn't do it just based on uh, short interactions mm -hmm. over the course of three weeks. Those letters are not likely to be good ones. So Anybody one of the have... life hacks, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. sometimes you get an opportunity to choose who you work, work with on those rotations. So if you could like do an away rotation that's specifically in PEDS or nuclear medicine or some subdivision, then you're more likely to interact with the same individuals repeatedly. And then as, as was said previously, you can ask them are there projects or some things that you can get involved with and just work your tail off over the span of four weeks. I mean, the students who are currently on our rotation, I think everyone, two of the three students asked us for letters. And so we all wrote good letters of recommendation for them because they put in the effort while they were there. And it wasn't just, I interacted with somebody for four hours in a rear. Awesome. Does anybody have a question they would like to ask? I don't want to deprive you of that. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a question about kind of when we're applying to programs, other than what you've already said, how can we know that a program um, prioritizes work-life balance. Sorry, I'm hearing myself echo on my cell phone. That's where the audio is coming from. But essentially, how can I know that I won't be abused essentially and just see a nice face on a Zoom interview? Mm -hmm. um, do you recommend speaking to the residents more or just how can I know that those five or six years will be enjoyable and I'll learn a lot as well? Yeah, I think that's a perfect question to ask the residents. Like, 
there'll be most of the time I would assume there's um, like we did dinners uh, the night before or a group chats the night before. That's, that's a perfect question to ask at that point. And then on the interview day, there was a separate time for just the residents and for the applicants to sit on the Zoom and, and chat. And so I think that's a question that you should ask the resident along with um, any other question that you truly have. Um, someone was asking me yesterday, like, you know, how do I ask the tough questions and without offending a particular program and my response is, if something is important to you, you, you need to ask it. Because if they get offended by you asking that question, that's probably not the program that, that you need to be at. Mm -hmm. And so if it's important, ask those questions. And sometimes you just got to know who to direct it to. So mm -hmm. if you have questions about, you know, how are you going to be treated as a resident? What call is like? That's a great question to ask the residents, but not necessarily to ask the program director. Mm -hmm. And so just directing it to the right and appropriate individuals. But I would ask every question that I, that I had. I'll also add that um, particularly now that we are in year two of COVID era interviews, I think a lot of stuff has moved online. People, a lot of programs have put some resources online, kind of built up their website. And so just as an intangible, I mean, and it's not, it's not universal and I probably wouldn't totally count on this, but it, it does say something if in the website online resources, they bring up issues of work-life balance and, you know, I don't know, various uh, family things that are available in the area or childcare or something, um, which just shows a, a little bit in terms of uh, their priorities and values. But, and I totally agree that asking um, residents is, um, is completely appropriate. It's a two-way street. It's an interview to see, you know, you're not just trying to sort of show yourself off, but you want to, you want to see what the, whether that program would be a place where you would be happy. So you need to be able to ask the information about the information you need to know. Um, sorry, I cut out there for a second. I'll also add, I think that this is the advantage of social media because you're going to do some of these um, meet and greets virtually, you might then be able to see the accounts of the residents in that program. What are they doing? So even without asking them, hey, do you have good work-life balance or work-life separation or work-life integration? That's different things for different people. But you can ask them what their hobbies are. Do they get to actually do those hobbies that they love? Um, even when they're hanging out with you, are they relaxed and hanging out or are they running to answer the pager or to prep for something. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, you can actually gestalt a lot of this um, from just good interpersonal observational skills. And if, you know, one thing I, I, I realized too was asking whether people had children in residency. I was single when I started, but a lot of people had children. And um, oftentimes that means that those are people who are going to try to push for some amount of work-life balance. They're going to have to have some time off, right? Um, did people take paternity leave, right? Those are the kinds of questions where even if it doesn't apply to you personally, it gives you a bigger picture of what's going on um, in the program. So, and anyone who has questions, you can let us know in the chat. But can, I, I, can, I, can I just ask Amari, yeah. my resident, who's a little closer to this process than me, like, do you have anything else to add in terms of what you would look for if you were in medical school? Yeah, looking at I, was, programs? I was honestly going to say the um, kind of exact same thing where when you're talking with residents at these dinners or at these lunches, just try and like, you know, first you can ask like, what are your hobbies? What do you do for fun outside the hospital? Because that's definitely something you'll be interested in as well. Um, and then, you know, follow that up a little bit later with, and how often do you get, you know, the chance to actually do the things you love? Um, Cause that's a good way to gauge, you know, how often they're spending time outside of the hospital and how often you'll be spending time out of the hospital. Absolutely. Are there any red flags we should look out for? 
So most of the programs, honestly, I, I feel like most of the programs are about the same, right? Um, but you, you do run across some on the interview trail where, like I remember distinctly a resident was like, she stopped me and said, you don't want to come here. And I was like, you don't ever hear that in a radiology program, right? So like, you know, all kind of red flags. I didn't even rank that place. So like sometimes you'll get, you know, a vibe that um, something's not right. Um, I've heard some of my mentees a couple of years ago that, you know, when they interacted with the residents, the residents didn't seem quite happy. There was some kind of undertones. And so I think a lot of it goes back to what was said earlier in like, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have to trust your gut and your gut's going to tell you, you know, about what, how you're feeling about what's going on at the different, different programs. And so if you get this, you know, feeling that something's not right, it's probably not. And so you, you do definitely need to trust that. I think um, I would uh, just to finish up. Uh, so what Dr. Bradshaw said earlier, I think is very true. If you feel like you can't ask, or if you ask and they judge you for it, then that is a that's a red flag, or at least that would exclude that program. So I do think that that's uh, that's very important. And then you know a little bit more on the work life balance and the the red flags. I do think you've chosen a field that tends to that tends not to run into trouble in terms of work life balance. Uh, so, so, you know, unlike, I don't know, neurosurgery or, uh, you know, um, other fields, I think in general, a lot of us uh, may have been in part why we chose radiology for, so, so it tends not to be one of those. So, so I think on average, you, you know, it may be less of a worry than, than maybe if you were going into one of those other fields. And then uh, as far as red flags, I, I do think that you, it is why you're meeting with other residents and is why you want to get to meet as many of them as possible. And when you see programs that maybe are in some ways restricting your access to the residents or monitoring that access, you know, to me that always seemed off. And I think that uh, for good or ill, programs should allow you to have unfettered access to their current residents. So I would say that would be a red flag for me. Uh, and then, you know, going with your gut, it's a tough one. I think ultimately you have nothing else to, to go with. So you have to go with your gut. And if, and if you're, you know, your, your gut is telling you there's something wrong, then I wouldn't ignore that either. And at the least do some due diligence you are developing a network here through us and you have networks through med school where you can actually do a little bit more due diligence. So please leverage those networks. Absolutely. To piggyback on that, um, there've been graduates from your medical schools or friends that you have who are in residency programs right now. They probably have more loyalty to you than to the program. And they'll give you a lot of really candid information about you know, what their experience is like, what they know of the experience of other residents and other um, programs across the country. So those graduates are really incredible resource. Often your medical school advisory deans have access to um, lists of who's matched radiology in recent years. So that's a, a good um, starting point if you need to, to do that. I'm just gonna add in terms of the red flag, I agree with absolutely every, everything everybody said. And, and um, I, I do think that having unfettered access to residents is key and, and any program where it, seems like it's hard for you to talk to residents, I would, that would concern me. Um, but going back to what Dr. Bradshaw, I think said at the beginning, um, where of, of thinking about what's important to you. Um, and if you ask about, you know, whatever, whatever is important to you and you meet a lot of resistance for you individually, I would think that would be something to pay attention to. Um, it's possible you'd meet you know, a, a sense of, oh, you know, we don't have that, but I'd be interested in exploring it and having, you know, them be receptive to the idea, I think would be awesome. It's great to bring something new to the table. Um, but if, if what you're met with is, you know, oh, you're not gonna fit into the 
box that we want you to fit into and therefore it'll be a problem, I'd pay attention to that. Correct. Very true. I guess I have a follow-up question. I'm going to take my headphones off so I don't hear myself, but um, access to the residents, since all of the interviews last year and this year in radiology are going to be virtual, how do you, how do we go about approaching the residents? Maybe Amaria can help um, answer that if she's um, went into the Zoom um, meet and greets with um, applicants last year and how can we go about that and also maybe later talk about Zoom etiquette. Yeah. Definitely. So I know. Sorry. That's a great question. I actually just uh, send a message to everyone uh, for something that I forgot to mention when I was initially answering your question. And that was in regard to if you do have any questions that you feel like you may not uh, be comfortable with, you know, asking during the interview day, uh, you can always, you know, ask for email addresses or phone numbers of the residents that you talk with. Um, we're always happy to give out that information and talk about our programs. Um, and last year was a very, uh, different uh, interview season in terms of everything being on Zoom. Um, so I think we did a lot more of kind of creating interview buddies and um, making it clear that, you know, we're happy and open to talk with you no matter what questions you have. I ended up doing a lot of like Zoom meetings um, with, you know, applicants who are very much interested within, um, with our program. And in terms of Zoom etiquette, I'll, I'll have to think about that a little bit more, um, but I'll let, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great question. It's a great segue, actually. So thanks, Miriam. Um, thanks for the great answers, Miriam. You've been an awesome addition. I need to get your email so I can hound you. Um, so, dear interviewers, help us. What makes a good interview? What's a bad interview? What is the Zoom etiquette? Y'all have been through this last year. So um, share, share, share. One thing I would say is that it actually went a lot better than I thought it would. Um, and I think that, um, you know, for the most part, I, I don't think it made that much of a difference for me in terms of my perspective on the conversation that we had. So, so, I, so I do think that that's a good thing. Um, what I would say, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not probably the best um, uh, what I would say that is important uh, in Zoom is the same that I would have said is important in in-person interviews is to be yourself, is to be natural, uh, is not to be rehearsed. And I would even go so far as to say, answer the question. Because sometimes what happens is you'll ask a question and the person will give you the canned answer that they have prepared that is like the closest to the question that you asked, but isn't really <laughs> answering that question. And so I think that I would be where not to fall into that trap. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I think at least from speaking for myself, um, you know, I'm looking for somebody who's thoughtful and sometimes people have to pause and think about a question and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes, you stumble on the answer as you're answering the question. And that that's okay as well. I think people want to interact with a human and not somebody who's pre-prepared uh, uh, packaged answers to presumed questions. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, I'd also say, um, Make sure you get good eye contact, which can be difficult when the person's not sitting in front of you. There's sometimes there's a tendency to look around. And so practice, I say practice doing a mock interview that's virtual. And then you can have the person on the other end give you feedback in terms of whether or not there was good eye contact, whether or not they could hear you very well. Um, I personally think that, you know, when people go on interviews, they have this idea in the back of their head that I need to go on a certain number of interviews to, to give themselves the best chance at matching. However, because some of this becomes, I'm just going through the motions, they waste interviews. So like every interview that you go on, I think you should convince yourself before I take this interview, 
that, for example, if it's Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt is the place I need to be at because, and have some reasons why Vanderbilt is it. When you're going to Duke, Duke is the place I want to be because, and Stanford is the place I want to be because, and be prepared because someone's going to ask you, why do you want to come here? And sometimes the response that we get is less than stellar, to be honest, right? And so at the end of the day, yes, we want people that are hardworking, we want people that are normal, people that are not going to be problem children, but we also want people that really want to be in our programs. And so some of the things that people fall on on that interview is that when you ask them why a particular program, they don't have a good answer. It's just us in the Southeast. Well, that's great. Um, and I also think that keep in mind, like, and I hate to say this because I know you guys put so much effort into your applications and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it's really about connecting with somebody on that interview, right? And so if you connect with a couple of people, you'll be amazed. You're like at the top of the interview, you know, rank list, right? So your job is to connect. And uh, if you connect with that interviewer, a lot of times what happens is they go back and justify why they gave you such a great score because they liked you, because you connected, right? And so I think that's the biggest thing that you can do. Try to take each interview for what it's worth and be prepared and ready to go and, and not just be going through the motions. Yeah, and I think I think the connection is about being um, genuine and um, being and not having just sort of canned answers for absolutely everything. Somebody who has a canned answer where immediately they know the answer and they kind of spout it out very quickly. I don't feel like I'm really getting to know the real, the person who they actually are. Um, and so I, it makes me feel less connected to them. Um, so um, I agree that um, it's about connection and, and don't worry if in terms of Zoom etiquette, at least from my standpoint, we know that you're having Zooms at home, you know, your kid runs in the room and that's okay. Um, your dog is barking, um, that's okay. Um, we recognize that none of this is perfect and we're all people and uh, doing what we can, so. I love all those answers and I'll add, um, you know, definitely double and triple check your mechanics. Um, make sure that your internet connection is, is strong or you're close to the router or whatever it is you need to do. Get some light in the room. Um, I do want to point out to everyone that Tool for Diversity does offer mock interviews. Several of us are signed up to do mock interviews. Um, and I'm going to conscript a couple people over here to join me in doing that. So you have opportunities to practice, but take all of those practices and all those rehearsals seriously. Um, I have known people to practice different versions of mock interviews. And there's someone who practiced doing one standing up because she felt the feedback she got the first time was, you have such low energy. And so she felt maybe if I stand up, I'm gonna seem a bit more engaged. I can sort of shift my weight. I look like I have natural movement. You know, take advantage. You can practice with each other the first couple of times just for the tech, you know, the technical aspects of it. And then when you go to practicing with mentors or, or folks like us who are just, you know, eager to help you, you can then try those sort of next level technique. What, you know, do I look too sullen? Am I um, turning my head away too much? Like, like uh, Dr. Bradshaw was talking about. So practice, I think practice makes it, um, practice makes perfect. I got a um, question here, an anonymous question that says, <clears throat> as a more junior medical student, um, what should I do early to get a head start on setting myself up for later success in radiology? My, I don't know, my, my answer might be contrarian, but I would say do very well in everything yeah. and not necessarily even radiology. So in other words, uh, we want to see uh, folks who are interested and do well in not only their OBGYN rotations, but also pediatrics and medicine and surgery, uh, because really radiology is so broad. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so having that ability to be engaged and have interest in all of those rotations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or the ones that are considered the core ones, 
I think I do think it's important. And you know, I think it's my job to teach you radiology. I don't expect you to know any radiology when you start. Uh, and so, and so uh, that that to me, I think, is more important than if you've done three versus four rotations in radiology uh, here or there. But but I feel free to disagree with me. And I also say, just check out the different fields, right? Like what you've heard today is that a lot of people discovered radiology later than normal. And it's because it's, it's not one of those core rotations. So I'm a big believer. If you have an interest in anything in your first or second year, just check it out. I mean, if you're in academics, you're at a teaching hospital, they shouldn't mind having a student come and shadow them. And maybe you'll get one or two people who are too busy at that time and just roll on to the next attending in that specialty. But truly take the time to investigate the different areas of medicine and see what truly interests you. And I think that I'd also encourage you if you if you do that and you find that you are interested in radiology relatively early, you know, try to get to know some faculty members um, in the department. Um, you know, see if anybody has a project that, that you could work on. There are also national um, programs that um, are helping um, students um, learn and research radiology a little bit more. I know the um, ACR has a program called, the American College of Radiology has a program called the Peer Internship Program, P-I-E-R, um, which allows maybe first or second year medical students to spend a summer um, in radiology, especially, I think there's some programs um, that don't necessarily have a radiology department in the hospital. Um, and so it's helpful um, if it's something that you think you might be interested in and you're sitting here in this recording, so that might be you, um, to reach out to, to some national programs. And I know Dr. Bradshaw has a boot camp. I don't know exactly the specifics of who gets to participate, but that's another way to, to learn more about radiology and be able to spend some time in it. Yeah, RAD Boot Camp is open to everybody. So regardless of what year in medical school you are in, and that's a great way to get some education oh, in radiology, oh, but also to connect to connect me. with um, potential mentors at different institutions. Like I know a lot of people have gotten some research projects through connecting with some of the people in RAD Boot Camp. Oh, I should uh, try to uh, mute everybody who's unmuted. Uh, so, uh, and I shouldn't have been so flippant. Uh, if you do know this early. Yeah, you are so Can we have, I'm sorry, I think the name is Amir. Can you mute? Amir, can you mute? Amir, can you mute? Amir, can you mute? What if I know my letter will change? Let's you, see if um, our host, Cameron, can help us mute that. The best. Cameron, can you um, help? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank also, you. I was going to say, I shouldn't be so flippant. If you do know this early, I agree that it would be uh, it would be good to get in on a project mm -hmm. uh, so that you can, you know, potentially uh, publish or, or uh, you know, get involved with uh, some research aspect, uh, you know, I think some programs uh, uh, do um, uh, look for uh, that as well as part of well, your. Uh, yeah, research. and mostly it's it's about if you if you know you're interested, just again being able to have a longitudinal relationship with somebody is great. Um, from my standpoint, it's less about the research than it is just about somebody getting to know you. But um, but I will also second. I mean, you know, radiology is a field that involves all fields of medicine. And so showing a, a dedication and, and an interest in a breadth of medicine, I think is super helpful. I agree. I also think um, part of the points that are being made here too is, I, and I want to draw it out, is that the, the, trajectory of radiology is changing, right? And so when you get in touch with a potential mentor, people reach out to us all the time. I think I could probably speak for all of us. I get emails, I get DMs on Twitter all the time. 
we hop on a Zoom call and FaceTime and chat. It's really no pressure. Some people, we form great long-term relationships. I know they're kids now. Sometimes it doesn't work out. But part of what happens in those relationships is that you get to understand what radiology is outside of just the teaching. So the history of radiology was one where the stereotype, you were in a dark room by yourself all day doing you know, quiet work. Um, but now radiology is, it's radiology 3.0, we're out there. Um, there's all these front, new frontiers in radiology. So you wanna make sure that you're actually aligning with where radiology is going as opposed to what it's been. And so forming relationships with people as opposed to just the book knowledge is what helps you make sure that you're choosing the career that's going to be the one available when you graduate. Um, so I think somebody had a question they wanted to ask. Hi, uh, I would like to thank you everyone for this panel. And um, so I have a question. Uh, one is about PS. So, um, what do you usually expect to see in our PS the most? Like, is it about our personality? Is it about our goals, skills, uh, or experiences? Also, another question that I had uh, it's about our interests. So, uh, I have interest in uh, AI and also global health. So uh, how much engagement do you and other uh, program directors ex expect to see in our application? For example, about global health, um, do you actually expect us to uh, have done something in another country related to radiology? Or maybe a um, little bit like um, experiences related to this interest? I'd be so <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, thanks for the question. I, I Maybe I'll talk about the personal statement. Uh, you know, I think that uh, from my perspective, it's your chance to share, uh, it, it's your chance to share what it is about you that you think is important for us to know. And I think, uh, you know, there's not going to be one formula for that. Uh, and I think that it, it's, it's hard and it's gonna be a struggle, but I think you do some soul searching and think about what's most important to you and then you get that across. And I would, I would advocate for that rather than any specific, uh, specific thing, because then, you know, if, if to the extent that people do these formulaic uh, personal statements, they end up not standing out in a way that's meaningful. And I think that, uh, I think that that's important. You know, once you've read a certain number of these, uh, it's, it, it is fewer and fewer that stand out in that way, uh, absent people who are really sort of uh, tapping into something deep. But that would be my advice. And I, recognizing that's not that easy to do. I do think that um, your personal statement is what gets you the ticket to the interview. You know, when Dr. Bradshaw talked about the interviews about connection, that's it. You're trying to find a way to connect. Um, so center your statement at the area of your passion, regardless of what that passion is. And that's the way that people are most going to at least understand you. They may connect with you, but at least they'll understand you. I am a huge reader. I love to read. I'm a book nerd. And one of my favorite things reading growing up was um, Agatha Christ Christie mystery novels. And so that's what I wrote my personal statement about was Agatha Christie mystery novels and how, you know, being in radiology overlapped with that. And it was interesting how many times that conversation came up interview after interview after interview after interview, because there was some part of that where people could relate to that childhood picture of being really in love with a character in a book, right? Um, so center it at the center of the area of your passion. Someone wrote, I kid you not, personal statement on fishing. Fishing. It was one of the most memorable personal statements I've ever read in my life because that's where, that's where their passion was. And so it was just, it was a really beautiful way to understand who they were, what they were coming from, what they were bringing to the program. I know that there are all these templates online, but we, we see those templates too. We can identify the template when it comes on our desk. I, I know how it goes. Um, so you have to make that leap of faith to step away from the template um, because this is a chance for people to get to know who you are. So seed it 
you know, where your passion is, um, because then you write from a place of, you know, joie de vivre and excitement and vitality and passion. Um, and it all just makes for a more sort of up-tempo interview anyway. And on the other side of that, whatever you put in your personal statement is fair game. Don't put something in your personal statement you're not able to talk about. Um, be really careful about sharing something that's really traumatic if you're not healed enough to discuss it because you don't want to go into an interview feeling vulnerable or attacked if somebody brings it up, you know? So if something did shape you, um, figure out what parts of that you're comfortable using and talking about, even if it was traumatic, but what parts you just really can't disclose because no, none of us, I mean, we're not really, we're not here to try to hurt you or make you uncomfortable. It would just make everyone have a really um, sad day if we inadvertently had hurt an applicant by bringing up something sensitive. So that's the caveat to centering it at a story that, that is important to you. Oh, and you had a second question, I'm sorry. It was something along the lines of global health or AI. Oh, yeah, global health or AI. Um, I don't think that you have to come in. I, I think someone mentioned it earlier that, you know, when you come into residency, you get the exposure you need. You don't need to know everything before you join. Um, however, you have to know why you're interested in that. So it's not like you're just saying these catchy phrases that you heard on the news. Yeah, everybody's talking about AI. I like AI too. And then you don't know what AI stands for, you know? So at least have sort of a working knowledge. Um, why are you interested in global health? You know, I heard somebody do X, Y, Z. It doesn't have to be your personal experience, but have something interesting and intelligent to share about it. You don't have to have personally done everything before starting. You really don't. And I, I mean, and I, I would add to that, I think it would be good to be able to verbalize why you're interested in it. Um, so, you know, if what, what about that particular topic is, resonates with you. Um, so, so I would, would add that too. And the only other thing thing I will add about the personal statement, and I agree with absolutely everything people have said, um, I'd be a little cautious in terms of humor, using humor. Um, just, I mean, there, there are some things that clearly are intended to be funny, but it's, it's somewhat personal and individualistic, and it's not always taken in the way you intended. So I don't know what other people think, but um, I'd, be, I'd just be a little bit cautious about trying to write a really funny personal <laughs> statement. So. Yeah, somebody who's a big fan of humor, I would say uh, um, it's a risk. And I, I think that you, for, for the few that you might get uh, uh, like a big belly laugh out of, I think some others might not. Uh, so you, I would be careful from that perspective. And then similar to what Thomas said earlier, uh, not just what's in your personal statement, but everything that you put in that uh, ERAS application is fair game. And I know I've asked people about things that were on there and their response was, I can't talk about it. And so if it's on there, be able to talk about it. I don't care if it's research, if it's research from college, you put it on there, you never know what's going to strike someone's attention or the interest that you guys put down into the little hobby section. When we're combing through these applications before we talk to you, most of the time we're trying to figure out uh, there's some easy things that we can do to kind of start conversations. And so if we pick something to start that conversation and you can't talk back about it, then it goes really bad. I do have a couple of questions from the chat um, and it seems to be in regards to kind of international uh, medical graduates. Uh, the first one being, what are the most important factors um, in view of, you know, of program directors for international graduates? Um, how can they make their applications stronger? Uh, and what are the factors that are most important for you? I, I do, I mean, I do think that uh, international medical graduates face an uphill uh, battle. I think that uh, it is uh, an additional uh, challenge in addition to so many of the uh, other challenges folks face, plus more. Uh, so, so I do recognize that. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, 
that you see uh, that some international medical, medical graduates will do is uh, do a, a lot of their sort of the research work uh, and demonstrate uh, through publications their dedication to imaging. Uh, and, you know, it becomes a proxy for the other things that we discussed, like hard work, perseverance. I mean, you know, it, it's clearly not easy to have that many first author publications. Uh, and so I think that that is probably a tried and true method. Uh, um, and so that's one, one thing I would share. And another is uh, to, to, to persevere uh, and, and to keep the faith and, um, you know, recognize that, that uh, it is a challenge, uh, but that, that um, you know, uh, with perseverance, I think that you'll be able to, to, to land somewhere. And, you know, the other thing I would say is sometimes you hear some folks say, you know, from birth or, you know, from in utero, I was meant to be an academic radiologist. So if I don't go to this academic program, life is over for me. And I, you know, I point out that many of our faculty here at Stanford uh, did, did not start out in these high academic programs. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, through doing well there, fellowship, projects, uh, do ultimately become academic radiologists. So really everything is within your reach. And then the, the other thing I add to that is um, join national societies, you know, join ACR, RSNA, get on committees, and then that'll allow you to network with attendings that are at different locations and you work that network, right? Like you show them, like you said earlier, you show them how hardworking you are. That's a you access to research projects sometimes we just because you've done research with somebody maybe they'll open the door for you to get an interview at said program where that person you know uh isn't attending yet so unfortunately i agree it is harder as an img but you just got to make sure that you're working all the different avenues because you never know which one of those is going to be the one that opens the door to let you get in yeah and it's an additional that, uh, sorry i want to say that Institutions are very, it, it's almost sort of yes or no with institutions. So we really do research to figure out which institutions have historically created pathways for IMG. So you're focusing a lot of your effort where there actually can be returns. Um, a lot of the institutions in New England have historically been more friendly towards IMGs. Last year I had two mentees um, who are IMGs who came out with fantastic matches. If you wanna reach out to me, I think my email's in the chat, I'll be happy to connect you with them um, because they have a very recent experience with this and they're both like just incredible, stellar kind individuals. Um, I think they'll be able to share some best practices with you uh, so we can lift as we climb, right? The other thing I say along those lines is that I know some IMGs, they, they've applied multiple times. And so if, if you're in that boat, make sure you're still reaching out to get people to look over your application because there might be something in there where you need to tweak things here or there. Or um, sometimes if you're doing research and that's what you're doing, you know, as a quote unquote job as a research fellow, there may be opportunities that you can shadow and get into the reading room so that you can get some of that exposure. So if you could then update it, let us a recommendation as you're applying the second time around. Yeah, and I think you guys are hitting hard during the COVID era, but I think doing away rotations sort of allows that same sense of connection and just broadening your network um, where people can get to know you a little bit if possible. Okay, I think you guys are touching on um, some of the other additional questions that were asked um, in terms of, you know, thinking about uh, where your letters come from. There was another question about, is it okay if all letters come from research mentors, you know, like two PhDs or one MD because of um, a student who is an IMG and um, like their last clinical rotations may have been three years, five years. So is it okay to kind of have letters yeah. from all research mentors? I'd second what Dr. Shaw said, which is that, uh, you know, even if you are putting a lot of the eggs into the research basket, I think during that time, spending some element, uh, getting exposure uh, um, uh, in the reading room, uh, and and uh, similarly having at least uh, uh, some support from that side. So 
you know, I think two and one is reasonable. Um, I think, uh, so you want at least one uh, clinical letter, someone who can vouch for your clinical skills. Um, it becomes all the more important as the number of years post med school increases. Yeah. So I think that that was a great point that I that I missed uh, that that uh, that I would second what Dr. Bradshaw said. Yep, I third it. And I do have one more question here, which I think you all touched on as well. Um, so again, from a kind of foreign medical graduate who feels as though even though they try to improve their social knowledge. Um, they feel like it's hard to kind of compete with national candidates in terms of socialization. So how can they make more connections with people? Um, and how does this play a role in interviews? Um, Twitter, rap Twitter is great for this. Um, the radi radiology is a really active Twitter community, right, Dr. Bradshaw? Absolutely. Uh, he has like a million followers over there or something. So um, I'm teasing him. So it's actually a really great place to get noticed from all over the spectrum. And you'll find that there are a lot of people who are creating programs actually just for visibility and shouting out applicants. I'll give an example. I mean, if you don't mind me put you, putting him on the spot, you know, people have put up their headshot on Twitter and said, hey, my name is XYZ, I'm applying in radiology as a fourth year. Here's, you know, a bit about my story. He'll retweet them. So, you know, he has friends, his friends, have power, you know? Um, and there's that's the sort of thing that happens on Twitter is a lot of visibility. A lot of the things that have happened too with the pandemic is that as physical buildings have closed, mailboxes have opened. My mailbox is open all the time now because we realize um, as people who are in academics who are interested in developing students, we realize that they need opportunities to grow. And so we have left our, I mean, our DMs are open, our people just randomly find my email and just email me and we set up a meeting. So I think you have to, you know, get a little brave um, to make that first step. And like, and like Dr. Bradshaw said earlier, if someone doesn't respond, don't worry, try someone else. Um, but really, honestly, just you have to make a few steps, put yourself out there. You'll find that there's an amazing audience uh, of people waiting to support you, um, you know, in emails, um, um, reaching out on social media, all of that. Yeah, and to, just to second that, you'll be surprised, like there are students who are really active on social media. And then, you know, I go to interview and I'm like, man, I feel like I know this person and I can't quite put my finger on it. And then it's like, wait a minute, I've interacted with this person several times on Twitter. So it's almost like you can build relationships that then allow you to connect with somebody on said interview day. So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So I encourage you to get out there, get noticed, be visible. And, but I'd also say, be careful what you're sending out there because you don't want to put anything that's too crazy out there because it's out there forever. So go through, check your social media. If you got something sketchy, shut it down. You know, create a new account at least, at least till after you've matched, but definitely be visible and uh, get out there because a lot of these programs they're doing where they're announcing their virtual open houses and stuff on Twitter. And if you're not on there, then you just miss it. And so someone was asking earlier, how can I meet more residents? Well, doing those virtual open houses. So um, get on social media, be active and don't be afraid as was what you said earlier. I'll even say that last year when we did this tour for diversity meeting, just like this, you remember this, they, the students, the applicant, the, the fourth years that were applying collected each other's emails, I think, and they created their own group. They were their own group. And it was the coolest thing that happened. I think they started finding residents. So they found a resident from Stanford who met with them one night and told them about, you know, behind the scenes, what, what Stanford was like, you know, they, they were very enterprise, it was very interesting. But I think sometimes it can feel difficult doing it alone. And so being able to do it in a group or on behalf of a group, I'm reaching out to you on behalf of a group of us fourth years who are applying. We're really interested in your program. Do you have any virtual open houses planned? Even if they just know that, they might plan a virtual open house for y'all. You know, So if you can't do it alone, find a buddy um, and do it, do it together. Yeah, there was definitely a group chat last year because I know one of the guys would he would just text me and say, hey, 
we have a question about X, Y, and Z. What do you think? And he's going to run back and tell the people in the group chat. So I highly suggest it's a way of, of sharing information that support one another. I have one more additional question. Please go ahead. <clears throat> so this kind of uh, deals with the breakdown of like who writes your letters of recommendations. Um, so particularly, is it okay to have a third, have three radiologists write your letter of recommendations and one surgery? Uh, is there like a particular breakdown um, <laughs> that you're interested in? I think great letters are great letters. I'm. I think the quality of the letter far outweighs the credentials or the field of the letter writer. Uh, now I know that we said certain things like there should at least be one clinical, at least one radiology. You know, those are guidelines. I think, but but the but the the quality of the letter far outweighs the credentials or the field of the letter writer. For sure. I, I certainly don't know a mix of, you know, oh yes, we need two radiologists and one surgeon or something. Nothing. But there is a limit. Please don't send like five LORs. We don't, I don't want to read all that. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> I don't even know, does ERAS allow you to upload that many? I don't even know. It used to, it used to. I, I remember one of the PDs got really upset a few years ago because someone sent like five LORs. It's like, why would you do that? So, you know, three is enough. And if you got four, fine. But, I mean. Yeah, no, it's, I'd say three is kind of the, the expectation, I would think, right. is three. Um, four is if there's somebody like who you, who really knows you, but I don't know, has, I don't know. I don't know why they would be an added force. But if you if you know a gazillion people and you you would think they can all contribute something, then get four. But yeah, five is. Well, I mean, I think an example of what you're saying is I've been asked to write if I've done community service with someone, right? So it's a completely different side to their application versus somebody who's recommending them on the basis of their academic their research or their clinical work so sometimes you can have that fourth because there you go <laughs> you know right exactly <laughs> that sometimes it's this other mentor from this other thing or friend from this other aspect of your life but does provide a well-rounded picture about who you are yeah. but it has to actually add value it's not just tossing everything into the into the, uh, right it's rest. not somebody that you uh, spent doing community service one afternoon right you know to go right so i do have one question for you guys um how do you guys feel about personal statement length length personal statement length yes are you one pagers or less i am a or big you... fan of one page i'm a big fan of one page i think there's just something really beautiful about being able to capture who you are in a way that's just enough detail but me wanting a little bit more. Now, I've seen some good ones that are a page and a half, um, but that tends to be the exception. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a big fan of one page personally. And if you have that, why, why are all those details there? Like, save something for the interview. I, yeah, I, think it, I mean, I think it can be hard to edit and uh, make things concise, um, but I think most, powerful statements are, have done that and are sort of, you know, the core, the essence, and it's, um, it's one page. Yeah, I don't hold it against people, but I feel like part of the challenge is to get it in a page. Yeah. And we recognize it's not easy to do that, um, but that's part of the challenge. And just keep in mind, like, we're reading through 900 personal statements. If everyone does a page and a half, I'm gonna get upset real quick, right? Yeah. And I you run the risk that they start to skim it instead of actually exactly. reading it. And that's what I tell, so I do offer help with um, editing people's personal statements. And that's what I tell them. If you wanna keep it a page and a half, you can. You just have to be aware that some people won't read the whole thing. 
um, and how much would that hurt your feelings? <laughs> so, so yeah, really I would say that it doesn't. You, it, it wouldn't hurt you. It just yeah. won't necessarily help you. It won't necessarily help you. Uh, but certainly, we're saying two pages. I don't know or that I've ever seen pages. a two pager. <laughs> I did. I didn't. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I know we were supposed to end at seven o'clock and we're over that time now. Um, does anybody have any final questions? Otherwise, we'll just let the panelists share some final thoughts and we'll round up. Any final questions before I hand it over to the panelists? Okay. Um, all right. We will... We'll hand it over to you all to round up. Um, can we start with Dr. Heinemann? I just, uh, I'm delighted at seeing you all. And uh, I feel really encouraged and um, excited and invigorated about the future of radiology. So I am delighted that you're here and uh, tell all your friends. Um, you know, I was, uh, I feel so honored to be invited. Uh, and uh, I see that our numbers are uh, increasing. Yeah. And that makes me so happy. Yeah. I think it is uh, the sort of the challenge and the responsibility of our time to help to invest in the future of our beloved field. Mm -hmm. And that means helping to diversify the field, because we all know that that will improve uh, uh, our teams and will improve the care that we deliver. So it is absolutely uh, uh, very uh, great to be able to be a part of this and something I feel very passionate about. My email is here. Feel free to reach out anytime. And I'll just say, I think you guys chose an excellent field, obviously. Um, I know this is a very stressful time, but you're going to be okay. Like everybody's in the same boat. Take a deep breath, send out your applications, and just do the best you can on every interview that you go on to. Mm -hmm. Then I also just say that, you know, obviously consider Vanderbilt or Duke or Stanford, right? <laughs> but um, I, I gotta personally... say, I want to go back and do residency with you guys all <laughs> over again. <laughs> so, like, I want people to come to Vanderbilt, obviously, but at the same time, I also want people to be at the program that's right for them. So reach out to me. I don't care if it's about Vanderbilt or not. I have mentees at a lot of programs and I'll connect you with them or I'll get them to tell you what the real truth is. And so whatever it is, don't hesitate to reach out because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you end up at the right program for you. Yeah, I agree. I agree with everything that's been said. I think you all are incredible doing this on Friday night. I think you all are incredible schooling in a pandemic and graduating in a pandemic. You're absolute rock stars. Um, I think you need to have your hype team going and you need to have whoever it is that's in your corner that just can give you that extra bit of juice you need to, to keep going. Um, it is going to be an interesting experience, but I truly believe that the world is full of kind people, generous people, good people, um, and that you will find your tribe. You will absolutely all land on your feet. Um, anything I can do to help you get there, feel free to reach out. But I also, as we close, just want to take a minute and just truly, truly appreciate this, these panelists. Every single one of them, um, I could share a really personal story about um, how awesome they are. And um, I mean, even as that last, last night, because of um, some unforeseen circumstances, we had to have a change. And I was on the phone with Dr. Heinemann at 9 p.m., 9.30 p.m., um, conscripting her into this. And she was just as lovely and as effervescent as you can imagine. And here she is. I reached out to Dr. Bradshaw out of the blue, like, I need you. He said, sure, I'm there. Um, and Dr. Masavan, I mean, he's wonderful. And when we were trying to come up with a time that would work for everyone, we were taking votes. And, and the first thing he said is like, well, I could do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. We're not gonna do Friday, right? 
I said, well, everybody's voting Friday. He's like, well, Friday it is. And it's just a great example of, of, of how passionate he is about this and how passionate people are about this. That it's like Friday it is. You know, tell me when, tell me where, and I'm there. And one thing I want to put a plug in for is also for, for all of you as you go through this process. Um, very, very soon, you'll be at the next step. And so just remember to hold space for the people coming behind you, um, hold opportunities to, to give back a little bit and, and ease somebody else's concerns as they go through the process. Um, so thank you all so very much. I've so enjoyed getting to know you this evening. Thank you awesome panelists. Um, we'll be in touch as, as always. I'll be asking you for something else. Thank you to my resident. Thanks, Imaria. And thank you, Imaria, for your <laughs> awesome contributions. We truly appreciate you. Thanks so much.